And there we have it. So, so how, Ileana, if you would um, yep. open us up and, uh, and lift up Connie. Yep. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to get together as brothers and sisters to read your word, your specific word on the mount. And Heavenly Father, may we all absorb the words that you give us. And may we all learn more about how you would have us move forward in our life to further your kingdom. And Heavenly Father, we lift up one of our sisters who has a, a terrific malady in her back that has resurfaced and could be very dangerous to her. And we lift her up and ask you to put your healing hand upon her and the doctors who might serve to help her. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that, that she know that we are here and that God is here and that God is with her and that God will help her. Okay. And Heavenly Father, we know that healing is absolutely for real, that healing can happen. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit, we know that. And Heavenly Father, may she know that. May she feel it. And may the doctors be guided by it. Yes, Lord. Heavenly Father, we these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 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 I, I don't Amen. know if you you know that Evelyn Watkins' mother died yesterday. Oh, she did. No. Yeah. Evelyn Watkins. Oh I no, don't... really? I didn't know that. No. That uh, yesterday, Pastor William sent a message. Uh, okay. Right here, let me make a note and we will can't find my notepad so nubia at the end would you remind us to pray for evelyn and her family yes of course that would be so kind of you i appreciate it so we've we've got the opportunity to cover one maybe multiple of these and since we have a little bit of a menu you know, we've got ask and it will be given, the golden rule, a tree and its fruit, I never knew you, build your house on the rock, and then the authority of Jesus. Are there any of those that particularly intrigue any of you or that you would want to start with? I'm, I'm kind of inclined to go through them in order, um, but if there's one in particular that you want to make sure we cover, what would it be? I never knew you, but I think it has the second one. So you can start from. Actually, that's number four. That's, oh, that's number, number four. four. And we might get there. We we might okay. get there. And that that's a hard one. That one, that one is 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 the one that I think causes a lot of believers a touch of concern. A touch of concern. So let's start ask and it will be given. And and we will make sure to get to I never knew you. So would anybody like to read verses 7 through 11? Sure. If not, I will. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, being evil, <coughs> pardon me, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. All right, we are there. Um, so it starts off, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. I don't know about you, but 
the, the first question that I ask myself when I'm reading reading those three three parts, what is it? Right? I think that matters because we're we're asking and it will be given. We're seeking and it will be found. We're knocking and it will be opened. What is it? Anybody have any ideas? A prayer re a request. A request? Sure, sure. Can uh, anything more specific than that? I read it as trust. As trust. Ask and trust will be given. Seek and you will find trust. Knock and trust will be open to you. Okay. Anything else? A relationship with Jesus. That's a good one. I would say understanding. Well, hello, Galaxy Tab S4. How are you? Is that what it says? It should say my name. Uh, sorry about that. It does. But hello and welcome. Hey. Hello. Yes, Hal. Or did mm -hmm. you say something, Hal? No, it's okay. I'm just yeah. saying hello to Doc. Ah. Hey, Hal. Very, very hey, good. Eliana. Pursuing well, a relationship with God? Pursuing a relationship with God. Um, I, I'm, I was, I'm, I was going to say the kingdom. The kingdom. Yes. Um, I'm Anything. going to lean. Do you remember when we, if you were participating, do you remember when we went through the study of James? Yeah. And and one of the things uh, that James said, if oh, any of you lacks wisdom, a wisdom, ask and it will be given to you. Right. And and that kind of took me back to first Kings in a moment in Solomon's life. And I'm going to I want to read from chapter three, verse starting in verse three. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David. His father only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Oh, I started too early. I'm going to fast forward to verse 9. Solomon says, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this great, this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or that your life, uh, or or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind like so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. And in that in that moment, I think there are other answers to what is it. But I think one of the things that clearly pleases God when we ask for it is wisdom. And why might it be important to God and, and important for us to ask for wisdom? If we're wise, a lot of the other stuff that we would be doing wouldn't be happening. To make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anything else? Well, basically, we can ask for anything. God wants us to to come to him for and ask for anything. But if we ask for uh, things that relate, like how said, to the kingdom or a relationship with him or growing spiritually, um, listen, we're going to get it. I may ask for a car and I may not get it. But if I ask God for wisdom or for a forgiving other people or uh, to grow spiritually or whatever, he's going to give it to me because it's, it's in his heart. It's, it's, you know, it's, what? it's, it's like the, it's like the woman at the well and she's, she's after water 
and he says, I will give you the water and you won't thirst again, right? So that is the it that in my mind he's talking about. It's not the water, it's not the, the physical material. kinds of things, mm -hmm. it's the spiritual. spiritual. Yes. Yeah. True. That's, and yeah. and wisdom is a spiritual thing. So I think I think you're right online. And and just like we'll see when we go to the build your house on the rock, mm -hmm. I think Jesus is starting this this passage, this this moment in the discussion, laying the foundation. And he's also calling us to do something. He's calling us to action. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. So it's not a passive thing. It requires mm -hmm. and demands action on our part. Uh, right. We don't just get to sit back and receive. Um, we have to, uh, dare I say, have an interest. Well, we have to seek. Yes. And that means I can't seek if I'm only sitting in my chair. <laughs> requires effort on our part versus a passive thing. It's That's an right. action. We have to take action. Very good. Very I good. Think, I think, John, that God wants us to seek and he wants us to ask, knowing and depending on him to give us not necessarily what we ask for, but what he knows we need. we need. That's a great segue right into the next part. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, if you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who seek him? Now in Luke, it's interesting. Luke adds one more component um, in, oh, wherever Luke recounts the Sermon on the Mount. Luke says, which one of you, if your son asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? So, so there's, there's, there's three things in here, um, three things that are sustaining, three things that are need, uh, bread, fish, egg, all of those are food sustenance. Which one of you, if your child asked you for what they needed to survive, to experience and have life, would turn around and give them something that does not sustain life, um, would give them, a, instead of bread, give them a stone. Um, instead of a fish, give them a serpent. And and if they were by the Sea of Galilee, which we believe that they were, um, in the Sea of Galilee, a serpent was more of a an eel. And it's interesting, if you look back at some of the context, um, the eel was an unclean uh, animal. And so even if the father gave the son a serpent or an eel. The child couldn't eat it because it was found unclean, so they couldn't use it for nourishment or sustenance. And uh, the comparison between an egg and a scorpion, uh, one's going to give life and one's going to cause harm or cause, cause pain. When we ask for a need, by those three comparisons, I believe that we can draw that if we have a need and we ask truly for a need, um, God's not going to mock us. Um, Hal, Hal and Jennifer stood before the congregation a few weeks ago with a need. Uh, we need to raise some money because we're going to buy a building. Now, the building wasn't so that Hal could park his new Ferrari in it. Um, the building was so that we could <laughs> gather so together. Weird. Oh, at least ways. <laughs> it's going to be a small one because the door is only this wide. <laughs> but 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 we asked because There's a need. there was a need in the community, and we, as a body of believers, Hal and Jennifer, critically want to take an action and help fulfill that need. And what did God do? He turned around and he answered that in a very very big way. The Lord fulfilled that before I left the church. Amen. Just so everybody knows. What do we do 
when we don't know what to ask. Have any of you ever been in a circumstance or a situation where you knew you needed to ask God for something? You knew you needed fill in the blank, but you didn't, couldn't actually put your finger on it. What do we do in that situation? Any ideas? Well, first of all, you could simply say, Jesus, help. That in and of itself. And the other thing that we have to remember is that as believers is that with the Holy Spirit indwelling within us, it will interpret. And, you know, even if we say gobbledygook, it's going to interpret and it's going to give the Lord what we, well, he already knows what we need anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I agree. I agree completely. When we don't know, so if you don't know what to ask for, don't let that stop you from asking because the Holy Spirit and God do know what you need. And when you don't, continue to ask and ask for discernment and maybe an understanding on what you do need, but surrender it up to God. I don't, I have no idea what I need. I, I know there's a problem, but I don't know what to do to solve it. I don't know. Ask God. And then really important, seek what the answer is. Knock and enter into it. And when God answers, and sometimes the answer comes in a very, very foreign way. Um, I wanted to lose weight. And one of my neighbors said, wow, if you ate less and you exercised just a little bit more, you would lose weight. Well, see, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. I wanted something that was going to be magical. I didn't want to have to, you know, I didn't want to have to enact the, uh, the, the work necessary to do what I wanted. I asked, I had a specific request. I got an answer, but I didn't necessarily like the answer. So when God does answer us, even if we don't like the answer, we shouldn't dismiss it as if it is not from God. Mm. Well, and, well, I and, have to tell you, sometimes I think for myself, I'm not wise enough to know what to ask for. I always have something in mind that I want to ask for, but it, it may not be what I need. And so I, I must say, my I'm always provided for for some reason. Oh, well, many times also, if my um we think that we can only ask god for very dramatic things yeah and uh and and we just need to include him in the very little details i remember very Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's funny because um when i uh when i lived in puerto rico uh we used to go to this big mall in san juan plaza las americas and it was always full. I mean, you could hardly find a parking ever there. And um, whenever I was driving, as I was driving, I was always saying, God, find a parking for me, whatever it is. And in seconds, the parking will be there. And the kids would always laugh, Mom, you're always doing that. Well, when my husband was driving <laughs> and going there, he was cursing. <laughs> And not, the kids, not, not me. Not this one. <laughs> the previous one. <laughs> the deceased one. The kids would say, well, I don't know, but mom always asks God for a parking and it always appears. <laughs> you know, little things. It happens. Yeah. I mean, you mm-hmm. lose the keys. You Instead of getting all angry and all anxious and I lost the keys and where are they? Blah, blah, blah. But ask, give me, direct me to where they are. He... He is pleased, I think, when we count on him for everything in our lives, everything. It doesn't matter, even if it sounds stupid for us, mm-hmm. but he has all the answers. Well, and maybe, maybe sometimes we just start praying and, and our mind goes calm enough and we're no longer stressed and we can actually recall what we already knew. Um, so sometimes the gift of God and the answer to that prayer is just a little bit of calmness and a little bit of awareness to what we already knew to be true. We, or, the, you know, the background or, goes away and, and here comes the truth. Or what well, we already be, have. 
there we go. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, John, um, you've kind of touched on it a couple of times and, and I've said this to a lot of people. I, I kind of get a little bit frustrated sometimes when I hear someone say, well, God answered my prayer. I'm like, well, God always answers your prayer. It's just sometimes it's the way you want it to be. <laughs> That's true. And sometimes, true. sometimes the answer is no. Absolutely, you're, you're right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, I've, I've I've always said that there's four different answers. It's yes, no, wait, and you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, seriously, if you think about it, some of the things that I've heard people pray for, I think God has got to be sitting up there saying, "Really, really." He knows what we need. And, and sometimes he knows that things that we're asking is not going to be for our peace of mind. So he, uh, he won't give it to us. Yeah, well, and that's a, that's a key. Um, he does know what we need. And sometimes he knows what we need to not have. He knows, he, right. he knows that if he said yes, it could lead to our destruction, not to his glorification. That's correct. And, and that's, that's why, uh, sometimes I have a great appreciation for the answer of no. Um, and, and I also love in this, how Jesus, Jesus anchors our petitions in God's goodness, right? His goodness, his provision. Um, what if a son asks for a piece of bread? What father's going to deny his child? Um, well, uh, we have some people in prison who might deny their child, um, but we're talking about normalcy here, not the uh, not the not the not the fringe edges, or a fish or an egg. But if all of that is true, and and Doc, you touched on it, why does sometimes he say no? Why will he answer one person's prayer, yes, and the exact same prayer of the next per person, both believers, the next one is no. This one I struggled with. Well, I, I can't say that I have the, the answer for, for any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's because he already knows what we need. And like the example that, that I've heard said before is that, you know, if there's two farmers and one farmer's crop needs rain and the other farmer's crop needs dry, and, you know, the one farmer is praying for rain and the other is praying for drought, then, you know, one of them is going to be disappointed. And, you know, how is God going to answer that? Well, you know, he knows what we need, even though we may think otherwise. And the, the hard part to remember is that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Well, not all things that happen to us seem good. Right. Look at Joseph. Uh, look at what he went through, and and uh, what the what what the enemy intended for evil, God used for good is really how he how he brought his story to a conclusive ending. Um, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we think God says no, and we hear or we realize later that his actual answer was yes we just didn't realize it um, if you've been around Avalon for a while you may have heard me tell uh, this story and I'm going to tell it very quickly and I don't even know if I, I will be able to get through it uh, but the date was October 11th 2014 um, I had been praying for a period of time that my mom would be healed uh, and in the afternoon of October 11th, 2014, as I lay in her room, as she was convalescing, um, and I, I prayed for her to be healed, even in that moment, you could tell that her life was about to expire. And then I prayed and I read and I prayed and I read and I prayed and I read. And then I prayed maybe the hardest prayer I've ever prayed in my entire life. God, if you're done with my mom here on earth, don't let her suffer anymore here. Take her home. And with my hand, God, it was within moments that she breathed her last, her heart stopped, and the nurse pronounced her. God answered that prayer, and it was only on my drive home that I realized in doing that, he answered the first prayer. I had asked for healing. 
and he did heal her, just not this side of eternity. Mm -hmm. She got healed on the other side. So sometimes it's very, very difficult to understand the answers to those prayers. Okay, it we are halfway through our time and we're nowhere near halfway through our our content. So let's move on to a tree and its fruit. Uh, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits, uh, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. What does Jesus start this passage off with? A warning. A warning. A big warning. Beware the prophets, those who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly ravenous wolves. When he uses the context of ravenous wolves, I mean, he's talking to uh, uh, people who are laborers, but there, there are an amount of people who are in this crowd who are shepherds. They will know absolutely firsthand and very intimately what the evil intent of a wolf is. Is. So he's speaking right to their heart. Um, um, do you have any, anybody have any thoughts on that? I think possibly he was, he was speaking of some of the people in the church who professed to love Jesus, but weren't living as mm -hmm. if they loved Jesus, that they were sort of just pretending mm. wanted to be part of the group i got gotcha. you now and 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 the 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 context of wolves see the wolf doesn't come into the uh, the flock of sheep with good intent isn't he, he the wolf wants to sit down to dinner but it doesn't want to eat with the sheep he wants to eat the sheep right mm -hmm. um so jesus is talking about false teachers people who would who would do what they would lead the flock astray they would seek to destroy the flock by driving by driving them away from god's truth right shepherd that's exactly right hang on my note well, says it, it mentions false prophets absolutely false prophets and false teachers yes so these would be the people who were coming in with their own motives that may have been professing to be followers, but basically they weren't. They just wanted their own way. They wanted to be looked up to maybe as prophets and teachers, but they weren't teaching what they should have been. Well, that's I a think possibility. In that I think in that particular time, as with many things that Jesus said, it was directly slated towards the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they would do a lot of things because they wanted power, not because it was right. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the common theme in all of these statements is they are more interested in self than others, right? They are looking to profit themselves um, sometimes at the absolute harm or disadvantage of the people who are around them. And in the ideas of the, uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the religious leaders who people trusted for their good, right? They were the, they, they were those who would offer the sacrifice, those who would teach, those who they would go to for counsel. Um, and, and you're right, doc, Jesus, uh, on a, a number of occasions, he calls them out, um, so I think there's also a strong possibility, if not probability, that they who are there, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they know that he's calling them out. I think the, the statement about, you know, know them by the fruit that they bear is very important. You know, we, goodness, today's world, you know, there's so many different people that we look up to and, and we, and we say, you know, 
we just don't understand. And 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 all we all we really have to do is look at the fruit that it bears. Yeah, and, and I think it's a good guide. It it is, but then we're going to see something that that contrasts that a little bit when we get into the ne next section. I never knew you because there are people who are performing miracles in God's name. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, I never knew you. So how do we, how do we discern? It's, it's not just the bad fruit, right? Although that is one, one, one area of discernment that he gives us. Um, how can we recognize, how can how can we recognize the difference between false teachings and true teachings? Well, we have to know the word to start with. That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we don't know the word, anybody can come with any story and we may believe it. <clears throat> I think you're right. So many times. Yeah, Ileana, I think I think you are are right there. Um, and in fact, uh, Matthew in 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 Matthew, I think it's around chapter ten, is a moment when uh, Jesus, in the midst of his earthly ministry, he sends his disciples out among the flock as shepherds to go teach them as part of their apprenticeship. He says, "Go teach them." And so Jesus recognizes that there are wolves in sheep's clothing out there leading people astray. And then he sends his disciples out amongst them and the people to discern and tell the truth. So uh, part of it is being able to understand the truth and to understand the truth. You got to you got to be, uh, I think. You, you need to read it you, and, and read commentaries and read good, trustworthy commentaries and all of those things. And ask for wisdom to and discernment. Yeah. Yes. yes. Because yeah. we can read it and then if you if you uh, start analyzing it in your own terms, in not in God's terms, then you become a false prophet. But I think it's very distinct one these two sections because one is outside we can tell the false prophets, we can identify them usually if we know the word. The other part, I don't know you, that only gods know the, the, our feelings, our attitudes. Our we heart. Know, I mean, we can dress up as anything, mm -hmm. the greatest preacher, evangelist, whatever you name it. But God knows our heart, and that's what he's saying. You may act this way or the other, but I know what's inside. That we will not know, but God does know. Very good. Very good. Do you think all false prophets are doing so intentionally or false teachers do so intentionally? Not necessarily. No, Sometimes it's out of ignorance, right? Yes, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And and again, the only way to recognize the truth from what is false is to study and gain an understanding of what truly is right. Um, have you ever heard? Have you ever heard the two terms? Exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis, I have. Exegesis and eisegesis. One is um, a method of study where we uh, we we draw from the word what it says, and we let the word interpret scripture with scripture and interpret the word for what it truly says, even taking into consideration the context of the people who were sitting around. You know, there were shepherds sitting around with Jesus. And then eisegesis is when we take God's word, when we take take the word, and we force our modern day view or our preferences, our ideals into it to reinterpret it sometimes to mean what we want it to mean. Mm -hmm. um, happens a lot. It 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 does, unfortunately, sometimes innocently, because I mean we all have we all have a set of glasses that we see through, right? Uh, I, I see things through my Western viewpoint. Um, I'm, I don't live in the Middle East. I don't walk on that sand and those rocks every single day. If I did, I would have a different perspective and understanding. Um, every time I go to Israel and we study and dig in and, and we're in the surroundings, everything is different. Just being there makes the interpretation 
and the application a little bit different. Um, okay, I went off on a little bit of a tangent. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so we start with a warning. And then just like we did with asking it will be given, uh, we see two discernments here. We will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So Jesus, again, gives a comparison between that which provides and sustains life and that which does not. And the people he was speaking with might have recognized when he was speaking of thorns, uh, there was there was a particular thorny bush uh, that was common in this area in this time that had tiny little berry seeds in it that could look a lot like grapes, but they weren't edible. So the people would have recognized and drawn a uh, maybe drawn a parallel between the thorny bush and the and the, and the small berries that were inside of it, and they couldn't eat them and grapes, which they could. And there were certain thistles that actually looked like a fig, but you still couldn't eat them. They were not a fig. They didn't sustain. So that which can sustain and that which cannot. Um, and then he then he goes on to draw the, the parallel and say um, a, a, a healthy tree is going to produce healthy fruit. Um, a diseased tree is not. And and as I as I as I chewed on this this last week and and thought about this, you know, it, it became also a an, an introspective moment I had to sit down and kind of metaphorically look myself in the mirror John is there one piece of fruit coming out of your life that glorifies God um, are you a good tree bearing good fruit or are you a diseased tree bearing no fruit or or bad fruit um, so there's Yes, Jesus is giving an, an, an identity of what to look out for in others who are trying to misteach or mislead or even to devour like a wolf. Uh, but I think there's a context in here that, that allows us to look at ourselves. Um, and s sometimes that pinches a little bit, you know, because mm -hmm. there's, 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 there's moments of my life when, when I am walking hand in hand with Jesus. And then there's moments when I've gotten off on my own path. Uh, anybody have an observation about that? I think that happens to all of us, but I've been thinking about the fruit itself. I mean, good fruit. Good fruit doesn't just an orange tree. The orange doesn't just pop up overnight. It takes time. And I think that for us to bear fruit, we need to do all of the things we need to pray. We need to be in the word. We need to ask God for opportunities. We need perseverance and patience, I think, in order to bear good fruit. It doesn't just fall off the vine in our lap. And I believe is the deed that we, you see somebody in need, you don't tell them, oh, God will bless you. No, you have the means you provide or you look for somebody that, you know, like that can help like Jennifer's doing. She gets this and then she come around, then we cook. And if somebody needs to go to the doctor and doesn't have a ride, and you can do it. And, you know, it's so many things that, that that it produces the fruit that God is talking about. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very, very good. All right. Um, so four, maybe four observations in closing on, on this piece. Jesus taught the people to avoid what to avoid and how to recognize false teachers so that they could learn how to truly abide in God and his ways. Jesus may also have been giving a warning to those teachers whose interest was not centered on leading others towards God. So he was, he, he not only gave a warning to the people, look out for the false teachers. He was also giving a warning to those false teachers who might've been around and, and, and skulking, um, you have a problem and you need to stop. Um, 
Jesus may have also been uh, teaching that the outcome of a teacher and of a follower or believer would be fruit. So we can, we can evaluate our own lives. Is there fruit in my life that glorifies God? And we can also learn from this um, that we can, oh, I just said that. So maybe only three points. Um, any other observations or questions on that? Very good. We're flying. We are flying. Oh, um, it's interesting. Uh, let's, let's, before we go on, a tree and a shrew, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. It's, I find it interesting that this comes right on the heels of what he says in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And then immediately after saying that, Jesus gives a warning against people who would lead you towards the wide gate or certainly away from the narrow gate. Um, I don't think any of that is by accident in any way. Mm. All right. How about I? So I think somebody asked what well, we've got. I never knew you or build your house on the rock. I think somebody asked if we would talk about build your house on the rock. Is that true? Oh, I think we lost Elizabeth. Anybody have a preference? You said I never knew you. Yeah. Oh, I thought they said, build your house on the rock. Okay, let's go to I, I Never Knew You. Yeah. I will tell you, this one, it, I struggled to study this one, but here we go. Not everyone who, well, it, would anybody like to read it? Sure, I'll read it. Thank you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but who he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Okay. I don't know about any of you, but I don't recall a moment in my life when I have actually ever um, cast out a demon. I don't know of any moment in my life when I have done an absolute miracle in Jesus' name. Um, and, and I don't know that I have the gift of prophecy. So whoever this is that Jesus is talking about, when I compare, and I know I'm not supposed to compare myself to others, I'm supposed to compare myself to Christ, but when I compare myself to this person who Jesus did not know, I don't measure up in any way, shape, or form. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? I, I just, am so not I, good on chapter and verse. I just know that somewhere it says... But wasn't there a time when the disciples came back to Jesus saying that they had told people to stop healing in his name because they weren't disciples? And Jesus had said, if they're doing good in my name, let them continue to bless the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and it was uh, because even... Even if they don't know me, even if they're not one of mine, they are um, guiding people towards. Oh, so yes, yeah, that that absolute that conversation did absolutely happen. Uh, John, I John, I believe that there are many people who are anoint. God has given some sort of anointing, but they using that for their own benefits. Like mm -hmm. this uh, prosperity gospel, many of them, yeah, God has given them the anointing, the, you know, prophesied or healing, but they, it's all about the money. 
And I don't think a God had nothing to do with them. Well, mm -hmm. I think it goes back to so you... many. I think it goes back to so many different things that, that the Lord has said is that it depends on your heart. If mm -hmm. you know, you yes. can cast out demons in Jesus name for your own glory, or you can cast out demons in Jesus name for his glory. Gospel. You know, what, what are you doing it for? Is it for yourself or is it for him? That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly, exactly. right. That's what and, I was saying before. You know, he knows the heart of the person. So you may pretend to be this or that. And, you know, but he knows the heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and also, Doc, I'm going to I'm going to put another layer on the cake that you just put down. Um, as I as I did study this passage a, a little, not as much as I should have. Um, but the, in the midst of everything that the person is saying as their justification seems to all be works based. Uh, Doc, you said it's self glorification, not God glorification. And, 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 and they're saying, I did a lot of works and we, we, we learned James makes it so, so clear. It's, it's, it's not the works that, uh, dem that, 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 that get you into heaven. It is your faith. Now, out of your faith, there's going to be a natural outpouring of doing good things for others. Um, but here we have an example of, of a works-based faith, I think, and some of the commentary supported this, a works-based faith that did not, did not have an outcome of being known by Jesus, of being one of Jesus' followers. So it's not, we've said it over and over again, as, as we've spent weeks and weeks together, one of the common themes in our conversations is not what we do or how we do it, but it is why. It is a matter of the heart. Matter of the heart, yes. Amen. Hmm. This kind of made me think of like, Oh, I don't know. All the movie stars and all the people who give Bill Gates gives like half of his fortune away to stamp out polio. But I have no idea of his faith in Jesus. I mean, he's a great philanthropist, but on the big day, that's not going to get him where he wants to get. And I'm not putting down Bill Gates. I'm just using him as an example mm -hmm. yeah, only god knows yeah he knows what his purpose is yeah yeah somebody once told god, me god knows his purpose hey that's true um and and and, and looking at um a tree and its fruit and i never knew you i also do think do not think it's by accident that jesus gave this moment or this content right on the heels of talking about false prophets, right? Because every one of those false, not everyone, can't say every, but there had to be a number of those false prophets, those false teachers who thought they were a lock with God. Mm -hmm. And now Jesus is saying, by the way, those false prophets we were just talking about in, in and amongst other things that Jesus was talking about, those false prophets, they're not mine. And if they're not mine, they're not leading you towards me. Yeah, I can kind of hear him talking to the the leaders of the Jewish faith on the, on the mount, right? Mm -hmm. I can hear him talking to them. Yeah. And you know, they know where there's good fruit or bad fruit and what their purpose is and what they're doing and whether they're preaching for the kingdom of God or for themselves, you know, they know. Yeah. And I think he's telling them. You know, I'm not going to know you if you're teaching for me. I mean, for for the, for yourself. But if you're teaching for me, then I'll know you. Amen. Amen. All right. We won't get all the way through it, but let's at least start to build. Or does anybody have any other questions about I never knew you? Going once, going twice. And everyone, before we start. Uh, a reminder, who was Jesus talking to and what would their 
um, basis or reference point of, of, of the foundation of their belief system have been? And that question was a little bit kludgy. Um, but Jesus, he was talking to Jewish people. And what was the foundation of their faith and belief system? The old Pharisees, scribes, and the yes, teacher. all of all of that. Yes, the the Torah, the Old Testament, the Pharisees, everything that had come before. Um, the rock of their faith, the foundation of their faith, was the Torah. Moses, Elijah, um, you know, all of those prophets of old. And here comes Jesus, and he says, "Everyone who hears these words of." mine. He's changing everything. All through the Sermon on the Mount, he has been turning the apple cart upside down. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I, I, I can only imagine the intensity of emotion that some of the people who were listening to him might have had, wait a minute, this guy just put himself again, one more time on parallel with Moses. He put himself on parallel with the Torah. He put himself on parallel. No, he just put himself above all of those things that we have held dear and considered the foundation of our belief system, our entire lives. Some of them were probably thinking, um, Texas, uh, you know, the, the four, four, four types of prayers. What were you thinking? Or, uh, or you said what? You know, somebody had to be thinking uh, this guy <laughs> is out of his ever loving mind. Um, and some of them might have discerned. We have a new covenant on the way. We get to look at this in the rearview mirror. After Calvary, after the resurrection, after John on Patmos and giving us the book of Revelation, after Paul and all the disciples um, going through and writing the writings and looking at all of that together. And how and after the Christian faith has spread for 2000 years, this yes. is the revolutionary statement. This is it. This I mean, this uh, in, in, in revolutionary terms. This is one of the shots that would have been heard around the world. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Found your, friend, uh, found your belief, your trust, your faith on me and my words and you will be able to withstand the storm. And the people who are hearing this, um, uh, where is it? Someplace in Psalms. And the torrent came, the storm blew through, and the righteous stood, and the evil one fell. Uh, some of the people Jesus was talking to would have seen the parallel between the psalmist and what he was saying about this storm. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, we like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it yeah. fell. Uh, deep faith, no faith, uh, false faith, false prophets. Um, are you going to face your found your belief on the truth of my word, or are you going to follow the wolves in sheep's clothing? Um, you know, all of this, all of this is separated for our convenience, but it all ties together like a piece of fabric, um, so so beautifully. And if you've ever heard any messages on build your house on the rock, I'm confident that you've heard. Uh, both, both builders experienced what a storm, right? Nobody escaped the storm, the follower of Jesus and the one who didn't follow Jesus. The difference is the one who founded his faith on the truth of the rock was able to endure and withstand that storm. 
Um, who, who a little while ago was talking about perseverance and building perseverance? Vicky, was that you? Yeah. And, and I love how Paul kind of puts that together, that, that perseverance. Um, pa Paul said, I think it's in Romans 5. He said, um, the struggles and the trials and, and all of the things that you face, those God will use to build perseverance. And then once you have perseverance, the, the perseverance to not give up when it gets tough, because you know God is going to carry you through it. The perseverance to, 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 to keep going, that perseverance, God will build upon that um, perseverance to faith. And that faith, that's not the right word. It's going to come to me in a second. As soon as we hang up, it'll come to me. Perseverance builds character. Perseverance builds character. And that, so so a trial builds perseverance, the ability to go through it all. Perseverance builds character. Character is the, 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 the willingness and the desire to do what's right, no matter who's looking. God uses all of those things to build one on top of another. And, and then, and then, and then character builds hope. And God uses all of those things as stepping stones to build one upon the other. And this is what Christ is doing here. He is building a set of step, stepping stones, one upon the other, that all work together. And then at the very, very end, when he was finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not one of the scribes. Anybody have an idea on what that means? Yeah, he was the new covenant, right? Hmm. He wasn't well, speaking on. Yeah, go ahead, Doc. It, it, he was speaking as one who actually knew what he was talking about versus just regurgitating what had already been written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scribes were totally in true tradition going back to Moses and going back to the prophets. And as, as he just said, regurgitating the traditions that they already had, <clears throat> rather than looking forward to something new. Very, very good. Anything he else? Was, he was preaching a relationship with him opposed to religious duties. Wow, that's awesome. That is that is spot on. All of these are right. Anything else? I think I think one of the other things that's demonstrated from that end is that the scribes talked about what God could do or would do. The scribes talked about someone else. Jesus talked with authority that he could actually bring into being or make happen what he was talking about. It was no longer somebody talking about what God would do. It was Jesus talking about what God will do through me or what I can do because I and the Father are one. Now that's, that's me. I don't have that from any commentary, so I could be 100% wrong. And if I am, I apologize. Um, but there we go. All right. So look at that. We... <laughs> We're good. We I walked all the way it. around the block. <laughs> we did. We did. Any questions? Any thoughts? Thank you, anybody, John. Anybody get an update yes. on Connie while we were here? Um, well, uh, considering it's my wife, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I was, I, was, I was figuring you were going to know more than anybody else, but, um, she, she's at the hospital and, um, she said that if it is what they think it is, it's very urgent. And she told me about 10 minutes ago that the ER doc is putting in a call to neurosurgery. Um, so, you know, um, it is something that probably needs to be done sooner rather than later okay okay um, 
All right. Well, we prayed for her at the at the beginning. Um, we want to pray for her again. And somebody uh, who's Nubia. Yeah, Evelyn. Nubia. It, yeah. Uh, Nubia, did you say it was Evelyn's mom? Ev Evelyn's mom passed away. Okay. All right. Um, so would uh, Hal, would you and Ileana mind praying for uh, Connie and for Doc again? And Nubia, would you pray for uh, Evelyn? Okay. All right, and then I'll then I'll wrap us up. Okay. Father who art in heaven, we, we come to you as the uh, healer, as the counselor, as the, um, our provider. <clears throat> you can do all things perfect, and we know that. Uh, we lift Connie. To your grace at this moment, uh, please uh, make her comfortable where she is and that she can continue trusting you that uh, you're going to be with her through all this ordeal. Give wisdom to the doctors and nurses and any uh, medical person uh, dealing with her uh, to do the right thing or the correct thing. And uh, please be with her and give uh, uh, Connie comfort there and uh, to talk to. He can trust and uh, feel at peace at this moment while she's going through all this. And we know that uh, you are there and we trust. Father God, thank you for allowing us to get together even if uh, through the telephone or computer or the internet. And because we know that when two or three gather together, whatever we ask, you will give it to us, Father God. And at this moment, we are lifting at the Evelyn and her families, her husbands and grand brothers and sisters and grandchildren. Uh, we know that her mother had live a long life and we, should, we know that uh, she knew Jesus and she had entrusted her life to him. So we know where she is right now, Father God. Thank you, Father God, because she's not suffering anymore, Mother. And we pray for Evelyn that she has the, the comfort of knowing where her mother is and that you, Father God, uh, send your angels to be around that house and uh, to comfort her and to enjoy your presence at all times, Father God. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we've been on a journey. We've been on a journey, and we are so thankful that you have been leading this journey. We've walked through a moment of your, your son's life here on earth. We call it the Sermon on the Mount when he gave such incredible discernment, such wisdom. Uh, and Father, that he shared with us so many things that are foundational to our faith, are foundational to our belief system. And Father, are incredible guides for how we can serve you by loving others following your son, all so that you would be given glory and honor and praise. We do lift up the doctors and the neurosurgeons and the nurses and the staff. Father, we pray for them as they treat Connie, but Father, we also pray for Connie that in the midst of this, in the midst of this challenge, that she would be your witness in and amongst those people that she is around, Father. Use this moment for your good and for your glory. And we'll thank you for it. Father, we, we pray for Doc. We pray for your hand of peace on him. I know what it feels like to have to sit on the outside of a medical facility while a loved one is on the inside of a medical facility. Mm -hmm. So we pray for peace of spirit for him. We pray that you would just gather around him and that, that he would be able to feel your presence. We know that you're with him. We don't have mm -hmm. to ask you to be there. Father, sometimes we need help 
feeling your presence. So Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would open his heart so that he could feel your very, very presence. We lift up mm -hmm. Evelyn and the entire family in, in their loss. In the midst of the moment of loss, there is also rejoicing because we do not mourn as those who have no hope. And it's tough, Father, sometimes to experience both of those emotions simultaneously, mourning over our loss and joy over their gain and victory through your son's sacrifice. Father, confusing for us, simple for you. Father, we just pray for them. We pray for that family. Now, we thank you for what you've given us. And Father, as we approach the next moment, the next hour, the next day, week, month, and years. Father, I pray that we will take what you've given us in these weeks and we will put it into practice. We will meditate on it. And Father, that we will not keep it to ourselves, that we will share it with others so that they would know your truth of your grace and your mercy and what it's like to have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We lift all these things up and we lay them at the foot of your throne and we thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We love you. We mean it. Amen. 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 Thank you. Hey, did, did anybody press the record button? You, you said you, you did. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It says record up in the upper left hand corner. So. Oh, so maybe I should press stop right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs>